Welcome back to the Retire with Purpose podcast. This is your host, Casey Weed. And joining me today, we have a good friend of mine that I'm really excited to have join us on the podcast. We have John Roman here with us. John, so excited to welcome you to the podcast. Hey, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It absolutely is because we've got some really cool stuff to cover, some things that you've actually gotten me involved in, things that I'm implementing in uh, my family life that I want to get to. But I want to make sure before we get to ideas about grandparenting and kind of applying all of your experiences from the Front Row Foundation, Front Row Dads, to being a grandparent, to being retirement, I to being retired, I actually want to go back to the beginning. I want to talk about what Front Row means. You've got this book, The Front Row Factor, which I just finished. And so what does it mean to be in the front row? Mm. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, appreciate it, man. Every time somebody tells me they read the book, I'm, uh, I feel deeply honored. And it was definitely a community project. So I want to I want to award credit to those who contributed. It was a lot of conversations and individuals. And of course we wrote about so many of the people in the charity um, that we've helped. And so, you know, living life in the front row is a concept of getting close to the people, places, things, thoughts that make you come alive. So just like if you were to want to, you know, be front row to your favorite concert or sporting event and the if you've seen somebody in that space or you've been there yourself, you know that there's an energy, there's a connection that occurs because, uh, you know, as one of my mentors said years ago, it's proximity is power. It's how we feel when we're close to somebody we love and care about. It's how we feel when we get close to, you know, if we're, if we're an ocean type person and we're standing at the edge of the ocean watching the sunset and we feel charged with that energy, we call those front row moments. Now, to me, this moment is a front row moment. Like I'm charged by your energy and, and how, how you show up to the world. And so when we're on this, this, this com we're having this conversation and I, you know, I'm in this space, I feel alive in a unique way. That to me is a front row life. It's a person who's chosen to, you know, show up, to step up, to speak up and to live in a way that's actively engaging. Um, you know, and, and also a front row life is one of service. We, we talk about this openly in the charity that, look, we're all about participating. I, you know, last 10 years, I've been a keynote speaker. I'm all about standing on the stage and sharing and contributing to the world. I'm all about my kids playing the game. But I don't want to underestimate the power of what it means to put somebody else on stage or cheer for somebody else. Because sometimes we, we, we kind of um, make fun of like the sidelines. We're like, don't, don't live life on the sidelines. I'm like, well, that's partially true if in context where, you know, look, if you're cheering someone on, uh, that's, a, that's an honorable place to be in life. You don't always have to be the one giving the keynote message or rocking the stage or catching the game winning pass or doing that stuff. You can honor other people along the way. So living life in the front row is one of service. It's about elevating others. Well, you can be in the front row at a concert, right? You've got, you're, you're really elevating the person that's on stage. So you that's can do it. that same thing in life, right? Yeah, you can it, put somebody else on stage and be in the front row there for them. Best fans get the best show. That's what we always <laughs> say. When the subline of your book, The Front Row Factor, said, transform your life with the art of moment making. And a lot of your focus is about moment making. And that, what, what is a moment? How do you make a moment? What does moment making mean to you? Well, so the, the, the idea of making your moment is saying, look, you, you don't control everything that happens around you clearly, but you control the meaning that you give to it. And you can certainly influence how your moments unfold. So you might be delivered some terrible news. How you react to that is such an important piece of life. You might be witness to something amazing and how you respond to that is an important aspect of life. We view your whole life as a charity. We've talked about this, that our, we believe that our whole lives are just a series of moments, right? You, you want to live an amazing life. You put together amazing years. You stack up amazing months. Months are made of weeks, weeks of days, days of hours, hours of minutes and minutes are moments. So one moment at a time, we're kind of writing the story of our life. How do we engage in those moments? What do we create in those moments? And sometimes we are just a spectator of our moments. We're like, things are happening around us and we're just watching it. And to us, we, we say that you can live life in the back row where you're kind of observing everybody. It's a very safe place to be. You're like, I want to be close to the exit. I want to early out. I want to beat the traffic. I, uh, you know, it's, it, and then there's other people that are like, I want to get in there and, and get active and participate and be in the moment. And 
that to us is somebody that's a moment maker. They say, how do I show up to this moment where I contribute something? What do I have to offer to this moment? If I'm in conversation, can I ask a question that's really interesting for that person? Like, I'll give you an idea. Like, I'm, I'm always thinking about how to be a moment maker. It's part of my conditioned, you know, mindset at this point. So I'm at a brunch this last weekend, a wide range of people that are there. We're standing around the counter. And what I notice is that the, the conversation's kind of topical which is nothing's wrong with that, right? There's an easing into conversation, but I like to get to the good stuff quickly, right? So I just throw out the question to the group. I say, hey, I'm curious, how has everyone, how did everyone's identity shift in 2018? And you could feel like the whole energy, of the, just the, the whole conversation stop, you know, completely pivots. And one guy turns weirdo? to me and goes, I <laughs> love that question. I love that question. And by the way, what it got to was people's biggest personal transformation over the last year. You want to get to know somebody's value. You want to get to know their life. You want to know what's meaningful to them. You want to talk about something that stirs energy in the room. You want to talk about something that like elevates the conversation where you walk away going, man, we could all be better because we know that. That to me is what moment makers do. They, they take a moment, an ordinary moment, and they turn it into something extraordinary. That's what we attempt to do, right? It, it's turning ordinary moments into extraordinary ones. We always say we want to turn now into wow. How do we do that? And there's a million ways to get it done. Sometimes it's what we, what we say. Sometimes it's what we don't say. We just ask a question and listen. Well, when you talk about that, that had to take a lot of courage in order to ask that question. I mean, I don't know that I've gotten there myself yet, you know, in those situations where you have a, a really cool conversation you could have, but it stays very much on the surface. Have you always been like this? You've always just had the courage to step up and ask a question that no. might feel really <laughs> no, awkward. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, this is like, I, I lived a life in terror as a young guy. You know, I was really <laughs> short and I was really shy and... No, this was something that I had to create. I designed the current version of John Broman. Now, there's parts of my core being that I can recognize that as a little kid were in my nature to be a certain way, right? And, and then what we do is we kind of go through life and we're born our true selves and then we sort of develop this false identity, this false ego, right? And we try to protect ourselves by wearing certain clothes and acting a certain way and telling people we like music we don't really like. And then we hopefully find our way back to our true selves in our life, right? We try to find our way back to our authentic version of ourselves. And I think there's a part of me that no doubt at my core, I love people and I love connecting and I love listening and learning and there is a core of but there's also pieces of that that I, I had to train myself to become that way like I remember I used to play this game with my friends where I'd say what are what are a couple of things you like about me and what are a couple of things that you would change if you could you know like give me tell me the thing that nobody wants to tell me I want to know what people say about me when I'm not around I want to know what people say about me when they're talking about me behind my back and this one this one woman really good friend um, Dr. Paulette Tutroni, you know, uh, says, I, I don't think you're that good of a listener, John. And I was like, I was like, that's not true. I'm a really good <laughs> listener. You know, think of the irony of that, right? <laughs> like I didn't even get the message. So it wasn't until sometime after that, that I, I, when I finally was able to let go of the ego and just say, could that be true? What can I learn from that? How can I be open to that possibility? Do I change my identity? I designed an identity around being a good listener. I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek out praise, not for what I say that's of value, which is funny because I'm doing a lot of talking right now, but it's what I, what I, what I, how I listen. So I determined that one of the things I wanted to rate my personal success on in life is how many times somebody would say, you're the best listener I've ever had. I've ever, I've ever, you're the best listener, John. You're the best conversationalist because when you talk to me, you're like, you look at me like I'm the only person in the room. Something will happen over here. You don't even get distracted. Somebody will walk up and they'll try to, you just, you're, you're, you're eye to eye. You just are with me. It's like I'm the most important person in the world. That is so rare and I so appreciate it. And you ask the best questions. I said to me, total victory. That to me is like, and I can, I can show it even in my, my professional life, how that's made a difference. Like I was in the college keynote speaking world and I would go to these events and I would set up a booth and I would tell people about my presentation and I wasn't getting the business. And I finally said, why is that? Because these, these people walk up to your booth when you're in these exhibit halls, when you're showcasing your business and everybody wants to shove down their throat, their value. Here's why we're awesome. Here's why you want to work with us. I said, I'm going to take a different approach. I'm just going to get to know them. 
I'm just going to ask them questions. I'm going to learn about their life. I'm going to, I'm going to be interested in them versus trying to get them interested in me. Business took off one speaker of the year award. It was like, Oh my God, like that's in little pieces of like that type of information have shown up time and time again. So, and I created that man. That's the, that's been hard work and I don't think I'm there. I don't think I'm the best in the world at it, but I definitely think I got better. You think you'll ever, ever actually get there? To the best in the, to, to, <laughs> to where I've arrived? Is that, yeah, are you ever going to no, arrive? Never, you never, you never constantly, arrive. constantly trying to tweak it and find always. ways to improve yourself and live more in the front row. Yeah, always. You know, and, and so much I've realized about life is not learning something new. It's remembering what's true. That I well, used- John, I've got to interject. The reason yeah. I asked that question is yeah. because, you know, I was talking to my wife about uh, this conversation that we were about to have here last night. And I said, I'm so excited about this conversation. I think John's going to be able to really, really talk about, you know, making a difference and making an impact, which a lot of people struggle with as they step into retirement. They're going, well, you know, what am I going to do next? Or, you know, how can I make this big impact? So, you know, after reading John's book, I, I kind of feel like less of a man because he's just absolutely killing it. And he's got <laughs> everything going in the right direction. I failed. You, That's not the purpose of the book, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you've really identified how to make an impact and you're doing it. You're living it every single day. And she said, well, don't you think that some people that are you know, 65, they're 75, they're going to go, you know, it, it might be too late for me to, to take that path. And maybe they, they won't feel like they can relate. I know what I said to that. What would you say to that? I'd say that uh, what we've learned is that the, you know, the best, you could argue that the best time would have been yesterday to start anything, right? Like in hindsight, the next best time is right now because a number of years down the road, no matter where you are in your life, no matter what, you're going to look back and question what you did with the days that you had. Um, my thought is always that our, our work, our best work can be done right now. I truly believe that our best work, if you're here, if you're breathing, if you're hearing this, if you have a heartbeat, there's a calling for you. There's a reason for your life, right? There's a reason you're here. And now we just need to uh, boldly step into that place. You know, and uh, I, I, that's what I believe. I, be, you know, I love the stories of like Dom Perignon inventing champagne. And it, I think it was in his 70s. And I love that stuff where you realize that people's best days, you've got the most amount of wisdom. You've got the biggest, you know, like this is the time when you've worked your life to get to that point where you might be in your 60s or 70s. And you're like, this is where you can make the biggest impact. Yeah. And you've done some coaching in the past on this. I uh, wait a minute. What'd you say? What did you say to her? <laughs> well, I, I, and I said the same thing, right? I, yeah. I along the same lines, I said, you know, I mean, I think people that are 65, there, there's no limit on their impact in the world. And along with all the wisdom that they've accumulated over the years, there's never a, a, a bigger impact they can possibly make in the world until that age, right? When you've got 70 years of wisdom under your belt, that's, that's right. when you can make the biggest impact. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to do anything in my old career, you know, ever again, but you can still extract all those really uh, great pieces of wisdom and skill that you've developed and then help a lot of other people get to maybe where you were a heck of a lot faster and have even a bigger impact. I think when you achieve some level of success, it's your, I've heard this said, and I don't know who to credit this to, but it's your job to send the elevator back down. You know, it's, it's your job is to, is to lift someone up, right? That's one of the greatest joys in life. And something on this point, Casey, I want to talk about purpose and making a difference is that I really feel powerfully, I I really feel like this is important to, to, to consider, right? Not to accept my point of view, but to consider that, um, we often want to put on a pedestal people that made a difference. Like we talk about making a difference. People will sometimes be like, like Gandhi and MLK and mother Teresa. And like, we, we tend to like put these people out there. Like, like our measure of success is when we are equivalent to, M, you know, Martin Luther King right? <laughs> or like, or Gandhi or something. And I think, you know, what we don't talk about is whoever nurtured Gandhi as a baby. We don't talk about whoever nurtured MLK or, or, or fed them when they couldn't feed themselves or provided an opportunity for that person to make a difference. See, we want to talk about and, and idolize and like amplify the Bill Gates starting the biggest charity in the world. Like I want to, I remember being like, I want to be like Tony Robbins because I thought that that impact and that reach and that like the number of people that he helped and all that. And then I thought, you know what, what we net, what we underestimate is the person who like had a conversation with somebody. And maybe that conversation shifted the direction of that person's life. Maybe it saved their life. 
I mean, the amount of suicides is incredible, right? And maybe it saved their life. And maybe that person that you talked with, maybe, just maybe, that person has the ability to find the cure for cancer. And because you played a role in that, you, you, can, never, you can never really know the impact that you'll have in your small way. But like, I think that we underestimate the power of a mom and a dad, the power of a grandmother or grandfather. Because I can think about the times that my grandparents have said or done things that have massively influenced my life. And not only just my, my, the, the people that are related to me as a father or a grandfather, but people that played a role similar to that, that I wasn't even related to. That, you know, um, you don't always choose your family. <laughs> or, I mean, yeah, you don't always choose your family, right? But you, you, can, you can certainly choose your, you have, you have a chosen family and your given family. And I think that the point is that we can be in relation to a lot of people in our chosen family and make a difference. So. Well, the same thing with me. My grandparents had a huge impact uh, on me when I was a kid. I attribute a lot of uh, whether it's success or, or just my personality uh, and where I'm at today was all the time that I spent with my grandparents as a kid. That's why we named the company after my grandparents. We've got Howard Weed and Ralph Bailey. We put those together because you know, that really embodies our values and makes us who we are. It's a way that we treat people when they come in to visit with us. I don't think we can understate the importance of being a grandparent. And to you, what does it mean to be a grandparent? Well, I'm not one yet. So let me speak to what it's like to have one or to witness them uh, in relation to my boys. So I'm in this kind of space where number one, my grandmother is 101 years old. I love her deeply. I've never heard my grandmother complain at any point in her entire life. And I'm deeply inspired by how she's chosen to show up. Um, total courage. Like when she gave birth to my, um, to my, to my uncle, um, she broke her pelvic bones, the way her body is structured. To have another child, the doctor was like, you will break your pelvic bone. So by the way, my, my grandfather was in the military. My mom, my grandmother's at home by herself. She chooses uh, before he's de you know, deployed to have another baby, knowing that she's going to break her pelvic bone, knowing that she's going to be, have one child that, you know, like in diapers, another child that's going to be like, you know, breastfeeding. And this woman's like pure courage is my point. Like her, just the way she chose to live her life makes me feel like I have no room to complain about just about anything, right? It's like, it's like time to step up, get stuff done. I love that influence. I love the influence that I see my grandparents have on my, my kids now. I love when they can say things and recognize my kids in ways that, uh, that they can get to them that I, in ways that I can't. Because it's wisdom, right? It's, it's dad's mom and dad. Like this is this big deal, right? And I think the way we talk about people and the way we speak things into existence is really important. I want to I wanna also share something really. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a tie in here, Casey. Something to my family and something to the charity. So I'm going to come back to Front Row Foundation for a second. One of the things we do in the charity is we write letters to our recipients and we invite our entire community to do that. We invite our community to write a letter to a recipient that is fighting for their life. So let's give an example. We have a woman right now, Shelly. She has two kids. She's in her 30s and her situation is terminal. And she is right now just trying to get every possible minute with her kids. She's recording videos for them that will be played at their graduations. And it is a, it is a both inspiring story and a crushing story and, and, and uh, a sad story all at the same time. And what we did is we got our community to write Shelly love letters, words of encouragement, prayers on paper, however you want to look at it, little kids drawing artwork. And we shower Shelly with 400 pieces of fan mail from individuals all over the U.S. that she's never met, but that are cheering her on, honoring her life, right, sending her love. And that is one of the greatest gifts that our recipients receive their words. That's what they tell us. I took note of that. And I was like, you know, what my kids don't need right now is more stuff. They don't need more toys. They don't need more stuff. But you know what they do need? They need words of encouragement. And you know, when I, what I did is I, I went to my grandparents, I said, rather than a, a birthday present, I remember when I, came, when I brought this up, I said, hey guys, rather than a birthday present, 
would you write Tiger a letter and tell him what you think of him? Like speak love into his heart, like lift this kid up, right? Like your words are unbelievably powerful. And I said, what would be so cool is if he, for each of his birthdays, and I know this is a lot of work and I know what I'm asking here, but like if each of his birthdays, he had a letter from grandma and grandpa, and we put that in an album and kept that. And like one day he's going to be questioning himself. He's going to be like, am I good enough? my good person. Like one day he's going to, somebody's going to shame him, break his heart, like rock his world. And I, I hope that he has things in his world that he can, he can have his anchors to who he really is and the people that care most about him, that know him the best. So I just want to encourage everybody that, you know, no matter where you are in life, that one of the things you can always do that is filled with purpose, that gets better and better with age is to share your words powerfully whether spoken or in writing or some other way, but that is something we can all do. We can do it daily. We can do it in easy ways. We can write a card. We can write a big letter. We can write a book and document your life. I keep telling my dad, I'm like, write a book. I want my grandkids to read about you, right? I don't think I'm going to do a great job. I think I'm really like biased in a lot of ways, but write a book, dad, you know? Anyway, just wanted well, to share that. No, that's great. And yeah, I, I want to ask a question about the book, but I, but before we get to writing a book for your grandkids, because I do want to talk about that, because uh, I think that's an interesting concept that I actually haven't heard before. Um, but you know, when, when you ask the grandparents, we've been struggling with this, you know, they get, that kids are just spoiled with gifts, right? They've got, they've got like a half a dozen grandparents right now. And that, that might sound kind of weird, but I mean, they've got Great, they've got grandparents, great grandparents, step grandparents, great great grandparents, and so they just get showered with gifts. We had five different Christmases with yeah. gifts at every single one. So Goodwill absolutely loves us yeah, yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, but I, I can't imagine being able to talk them into, hey, can you just write them a letter? You know, let's put the gifts away. Yeah. So do they put the gifts away, or are they just giving them gifts and a letter? <laughs> yeah, it's a, well, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, we and we're navigating that. It's not a perfect. Romans are not perfect. Let me be clear about that, right? We got we have lots of struggles here. Um, no, in this this Christmas, they got them a, a a really cool. Got the boys a tent. You know, because one of the things they said is we also want to create experiences for the boys. So when we get toys or things like that, we want to create experiences or things that bring the family together. We just tried to create some value around the gifts. Right. Um, so, th no, the, the Christmas gifts, we, we didn't avoid that. The birthday gifts we have, we have avoided them. Um, and, and grandma and grandpa have also put away some cash. So this is actually something that I, I think my dad has done really well, which is he invested right to set up a fund for my boys. And that money is dedicated for their education. And he wrote out kind of the rules of how he wants that money to be used. And it's like you can use it in these ways for this particular type of education. And if you don't, it just, that money comes back to me. If it's, if you want to use it, it's there, but you has to be used for these types of things. So it's my money, I'm in control, but it's in your name. And if you choose to use it in this way, you can. And That's I think really, cool. really wonderful. So I think if we are going to pass along some form of wealth in that way, I like the idea of funding educational programs like that. I love that. Sure. Yeah. And uh, along the lines of writing a book, though, that was also another good idea you had. And I've heard people that want to do this, yeah. um, but coming from someone that's written a book, I, you know, what if somebody wants to do this, but they're just concerned about the process? How do I go about this process? What's the yeah. easiest way to do it? If someone wanted to write a book, maybe they're bad at writing, you know, yeah. but they really want to deliver these messages and philosophies to the next generation to have the biggest impact. Mm -hmm. How would you say they go about that? Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you two ways to do this, right? And um, I'm going to give you the way that's free <laughs> or, or mostly free. So if somebody is working on a budget um, and, or likes to do it themselves, I'll give you that way. And then I'll also tell you a way that you can get it done. If you have capital and you want to hire the right team, I've got an easy way to get that done. Um, so my friend, Tucker Max has a business that he started, uh, which was actually originally named Book in a Box, and then uh, and, and now is under the name of Scribe Media. And Scribe Media, what they do, their tagline is, we unlock the world's wisdom. And I remember having a conversation with, uh, with Tucker, and he said, you know, there's so many people out there that we want to help them pass along their wisdom, um, but they just don't 
they don't, that's a lot of steps to take, if, especially if they don't consider themselves a writer to sit down and then how do you get it published and all the things that go into the decisions and people often get paralyzed when it comes to all those decisions and just don't do anything. He said, he said, John, think about it. He says, even, uh, even Jesus didn't write the Bible. <laughs> and I was like, that's so true. Huh. You know, in some way it's spoken out loud. Right. And then, and then actually put on paper by other people. And, um, and I thought about that and I, that's how I started my first book was actually, I had my best friend, John Kane, come over to my house early mornings at 4.30 AM. We set up a microphone in my basement and he just started asking me questions and I started rattling off answers into the microphone. We had it transcribed and then we had somebody, uh, start to assemble the book together. That's how it started. Now it didn't actually end up that way. I ended up writing a lot of the book because along the journey, I actually found out that I enjoyed the writing process. The mm -hmm. story I told myself was that I wasn't a writer and that I never liked writing. That was a story I told myself starting back at 16 years old. But what we ended up, so, so there's, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. One is you go to Scribe Media and I don't know how much it costs, uh, but I think it's about 25,000 bucks. For 25,000 bucks, they will hop on the phone with you. They'll interview you. They will help put all that information into a book, literally write the book, hand it to you. You edit it. They're your words. You've spoken them out loud. You're literally transcribing your words. They're just helping you organize the words, put it in a book. They'll help you design the cover. They'll get it edited. They'll get it formatted. They will help you upload it to Amazon and print the book. And that's what they do. That's what they're experts in. It is a beautiful process. I think it's one of the, you know, I think if somebody was actually saving $150,000 for their kids, education. Let's say a grandparent is doing this, right? For their, their grandkids. I'm going to put, a, put away money, whatever that money is. I think if they have the means, consider allocating some of those funds to writing a book about you and your family's life. And by the way, it doesn't have to be read by anybody else in the world. It could literally just be a family heirloom. Um, but I actually will tell you that uh, one of my friends, John O'Leary, who was burned in a fire over 90% of his body, his family ended up writing a book just to say thank you to the people who supported the family. That book went on to become an amazing bestseller. So mm -hmm. That's what sometimes happens there. And then I, I want to quickly get to this other piece. So the other way to do it is like you can literally sit down with a Word document, write your book. This is no joke. You can write your book and you can basically go to Amazon or you hire somebody to do this for $500. You go to Amazon and you can upload your own book to Amazon and be a published author as fast as you can snap your fingers. It is incredibly easy. And all you would need to do is just hire a person to navigate that process. And you could find that person almost anywhere. You could literally Google, help me get my book on Amazon and you'll find tons of services out there to do that. So if you just want to put words on paper and get it into Amazon and ability to pass it along, you could do that. It's much easier than people think. Now, writing a best-selling book, different story. <laughs> Not always <laughs> <laughs> but writing any book, it's like people ask you, they go, how do you start a charity? I go, that's easy. Just fill out some paperwork and you're a charity. Now running a charity is very <laughs> Yeah, I, I think a lot of people are really intimidated by the whole book writing process. Uh, I just finished my third and I, I think everybody's unique. I mean, I've met a lot of people that do, yeah. like you said, they voice the book and then somebody else does the writing. I've been someone that I just have to write it. You know, that's the only way, I, that's the way my mind works. And yeah. I don't write like, you know, a thousand words a day like some do. You know, I'll sit down, I'll block out myself on the calendar for two weeks and lock myself in a, yeah. you know, in a room and, and come out two weeks later with a book. Mm -hmm. That's just that's just the way I have to operate. Everybody's unique in that way. One of the unique things that you do is you've got Front Row Dads, right? And Front Row Dads is a, a group that I just joined. We'll have a couple of retreats a year. And it's just this community of dads that are also businessmen, but they're, they're family men that happen to run businesses. They're that's not right. businessmen that have families. And I love that concept. That's why I joined the group and I can't wait to come in for my first retreat here in a few weeks uh, and spend some time with everyone. But I'm interested as someone that's been a part of this group for a long time, been a front row dad for a long time, and we get together, uh, you have these conversations with individuals and come up with some really cool ideas. And then you've got these grandparents that are spending a lot of time with your kids and I wonder you know have you had any really valuable or impactful things come out of that experience in front row dads that the, your your parents or uh, your kids grandparents are applying to what they're doing yeah you know there there have been and I can think about a couple that come to mind right away and you know this idea of the family board meeting um, one of my very good friends Jim Shields uh, 
you know, wrote this book, The Family Board Meeting, and his story is really great, you know, very successful real estate investor and developer. And then, you know, uh, he was, he was just asking himself, he's like, why do I have these scheduled board meetings for my, my business? Like, I, you know, I'll get people, I'll, I'll plan and I'll think and I'll strategize and I'll get together, I'll spend all this time, but why am I not doing that with my kids? Why am I not having dedicated time, like once a quarter, that's very special where we get together and and what would that look like? What version would that look like? And the board meeting was kind of a, a play on words because he's also a surfer, lives in Florida. So the board was yeah. the surfboard and like that time that we'd get together. But he created this program. It was based, it's very simple for him. It's four hours, you know, four hour stretch, uh, uninterrupted, you know, one to one time, no technology and, you know, activities of the kids choosing our guys took to this and implemented it immediately, right? Once a quarter, one-to-one -one time with each of their kids and, and they're planning out board meeting agendas. Their kids are getting involved. They're counting down the days. It's on the calendar in the house. It's really cool, right? There's a lot of value to that. But what we also found was that this concept sort of transcended then into when does that ever end? Why, why does that have to end? Why is it only, why do, why do we originally think that that concept is best suited for a guy who has a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, but why not a 43-year-old and a 73-year-old? Regularly scheduled, one-to-one -one time, on the books, recurring every year, and whether you do it every quarter or twice a year or whatever it is, one of my best friends, John Kane, um, lost his dad this past year. And I've watched that, I've watched the impact of that. And he said to me multiple times when we've been talking, and, and he may have even been in tears the majority of these times where he said to me, he said, John, he said, I would give anything to have another day with my dad. He said, I want you to go home right now and I want you to schedule something with your dad. I want you to schedule one-to-one -one time with your dad. Like get it on the calendar, no excuses, go away, spend time. And to me, that's, you know, it's so simple. It's so easy. But again, like, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, it's like, it's not always about new. It's about true. A lot of times we're looking for that new sexy idea. A lot of times what we need to be reminded is of the truth behind the good old ideas. The ones that are like, Hey, there's, there's a lot of truth to that one to one time. So I think like it's, it's ideas like that, that that's not a novel con. If you said to any of the guys in the group, was that a new idea? One-to-one -one time? They're like, no, but it's the way we talk about it. The way that we bring it to attention, bring it to, to, to our attention, the way that we create accountability amongst each other, the way that we revisit the idea and celebrate the victories and talk about what happens on those one-to-one -one times. What questions do you ask? You know, Jim even talked about asking specific questions and he taught specific questions of what you would talk to your dad about. He did this with his dad. He went and sat down and he's like, you know what? He, he listed out some of his favorite questions with his dad, right? So you think about that. We'll spend hours planning a board meeting for people that are just part of our company, but yet we oftentimes don't spend time planning out our dinner routines with our families or our meetings with our parents. And we say it's really important, but it just doesn't get the time it deserves. What does this look like in your family for the grandparents? Uh, how have they implemented? What's the structure look like? Well, there's a couple of things. So one is like, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of how this shows up for us. So we have family vacation every year with all of us, right? So we'll all go to some place together. But then and you're talking about both. Do they, are, are all grandparents living or? Yep. Yep. Both. Yep. So, so my, uh, my grand, my mom and dad, right? So my mom and dad, my, my grandmother at 101 is no longer traveling, but my mom and dad, my kids, right? So that those generations will come together with my sister and her daughter. And we uh, often will go to a place in Wisconsin, a little lake called Shell Lake, a, a lake that my dad grew up on, like literally as a kid. So he played in the water at two. I played in the water at two. My kids have played in the water at two years old, right? So it's like, a, it's a cool place. Lots of, there's, there's literally like, you know, concrete blocks on the walkway that have my dad's initials in from like 1946. You know, it's really cool. Um, there's a, there's a height chart on the wall. One of the things that we wanted to do to bring generations together is like have a height chart that actually you pass along. 
So my dad is measured at five years old on the wall. I'm measured at five years old on the wall. My son's measured at five years old. It's really cool, right? That's awesome. What we'll do is when we go there, then the question is, how do we get one-to-one time at the place? How do my dad and I get one-to-one time? How does my dad get time with my kids one-to-one? How do we structure our time when we're together in those ways? Because they live in Virginia. I live in Texas. So, you know, one-to-one time regularly with grandparent and grandkids is not happening. But this all comes back to intention and planning. This all comes back to how we structure it and how we make this a priority in our lives. Because a lot of people will tell you they've, everybody's heard this, spend time, right? Not a lot of people are executing on that. You know, and I know you are, um, and I know a lot of guys in our group are, but even guys in our group that are really successful guys, really smart guys, really good at their calendars, they were not doing this in a way that was meaningful for them. Like we have one guy who literally was talking with Jim Shields, the guy I was mentioning wrote the book. They were doing a little session in the front of the room. And what Jim did is he had this guy think forward in his life to the end of his life and look back and feel the pain of missing out on his kids' lives. And the joy of what it would felt like knowing he showed up as a dad. And the, dude, the guy's in tears. He's crying. And since that day, he's never missed a board meeting with his kids. That's awesome. And that, heck, that quote from the book, I really liked. I, looking, and I want to reemphasize that. We, you said, we must look to the end and reverse engineer it from there to understand what needs to happen today. And what needs to happen today might be time with those kids. And for some, you might already be spending time with your grandkids. You might already be spending time with your children, but it's quality time, which we often hear it's quality time, but it's also about asking questions during these board meeting types. And so if we're spending that time with our grandkids, what do you think are some of the most valuable questions that a grandparent could use during those moments to make the best of it? You ready? What's on your mind? Like, that's a question. What's on your mind, right? What's on your mind? What are you excited about? What's new? Who's fun? What's fun? Who's your best friend? You know, like any, like there's, you, I, what I would recommend is I think it's actually important to sit down and write out those questions or that grandparents, as an example, could be asking other grandparents when you connect with your grandkids, what questions connect? right? What's working? Like we should just approach it like we do everything else in our life where we make it our mission. We, we, we're thoughtful about it. To me, um, you know, uh, some, you know, some of the questions I think that work for my kids, when you keep it simple, I have young kids, so I have nine and four year old, right? And we, at the end of every day, we, we do a happy crappy. (laughs) And so like, what are you happy about? Right? What was a happy moment of your day? And what was a crappy moment of your day? And the kids love it. You know, little Ocean's four years old. And he's like, my crappy. Like, he always starts <laughs> like, my, my crappy. Uh, and then he, like, he'll say, my other crappy. And then Big Brother's like, you can only do one crappy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, here's what I think that people should be considering, no matter where you are. But listen, if you've got time on your hands, if you're in a place where you are in a rewirement phase of your life, and I love that concept, right? You should not call it retirement. You should call it rewirement. You're rewiring your, your, yourself for a new phase of your life, for a new journey, for a new adventure. The most exciting, you know, the most, I don't want to say exciting one, it doesn't have to be exciting. The most meaningful one, the most purpose-driven one, the most valuable one of your life, that you, you can move mountains with the intentional question, conversation. And don't be afraid, you know, like my thought is don't be afraid. You know, when I can tell that my, my parents are sometimes fearful. I can sense it. You know, they're fearful to like say the wrong thing or do it. I'm like, you just, this is a place you have to play boldly as well. You know, when you're in these conversations, you're going to mess up. Kids are going to look at you like you're an idiot. You know, you're going to, you know, you're going to say the wrong thing or you're going to talk to him like, you know, kid's going to be nine and you're going to be like, how's it going little Billy? And he's like, I'm nine, dude. You don't have to talk to me. Like, I'm, you know, <laughs> you know it's, we're going to mess up a lot of stuff, but that's okay. But you know here's what I would encourage people to think about. What's the brand of your family you want to pass down? What are the values that you want to pass along? I think when you spend time with somebody, it's good to be intentional to say, what do you want your family to be about? Like I often say to my kids, I'm like, that's not how the Romans operate. Or this is how the Romans operate. You, you, we do this because you're a Roman. What does it mean to be part of your family? And when you have a chance to influence kids, you have a chance to pass along values. And the way that you can do that is a bunch of different ways. Like you can just take kids to volunteer. 
you can take kids to a soup kitchen. You can take kids to the library if you want to instill the value of reading. You can take kids into nature for a walk and instill the value of nature. Like there's a, a there's a thousand ways to instill values. It's just how you're spending time. And don't underestimate the power of like casual interactions. You take your kid to a store to buy something, the way you talk to the person at the checkout counter instills a value of how we treat strangers. When somebody cuts you off in your car, you instill a value of how we deal with adversity, how you deal with people that seem to be careless or unaware. It's like, do you curse them or do you like, hey, I wonder, they must have something on their mind. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're in a rush. Maybe somebody's hurt in the car and they're not paying attention. Like we, we have so many opportunities to influence. Well, a lot of it's just about leading by example, right? And and really setting the right example that we want them to have. It's just like leading in the workplace. If that's maybe what you did uh, during your working career, you have the opportunity to be a whole new leader, a leader in your family and pass on values and pass on valuable lessons uh, to that next generation. And you know, one of the things I know you do is you ask yourself questions every single day to just spark that thought of, well, well how can I make the, the, somebody's day great today? How can I you know, make a big impact? How can I make the most of it a day? How can I create a moment for myself, create a moment for someone else? And, you know, there's a lot of values uh, that we could pass on to our kids, a lot of valuable lessons and things that we could teach our grandkids, but it's good if we prioritize, right? It's like, okay, I know that I want to teach them these three things because these are the most important to me, or these are the things that are going to have the biggest impact. Do you think that there are some things that maybe stand out? Maybe it's one valuable lesson you think every grandkid needs to pass on to their kids, or maybe it's a list of three. What do you think are the most important things? And then can we just write those things down and keep them at the top of our mind all every single time we make that interaction with the kids yeah you know i i, I could approach it from how what i might think you know if i were in that situation but i think the real exercise is in somebody figuring out what is important what are those values like take that time if what you have is more time than ever before because let's say you have invest excuse me, invested wisely, you know, and you've, you've created a situation for yourself, regardless of how you got there, where you have a little time on your hands and you're asking, what do I do with this time? The, one of the first and most important lessons, it's not only a lesson you can practice, it's one you can teach is that of silence. It's that of contemplation. It's that of thinking. It's actually, you don't have to be busy all the time, but it does need to be directed because, you know, uh, I've seen enough people. Um, I have friends that are in their 70s, you know, that I hang out with. I have, I have men that I am, have a great relationship with that are, you know, that are not related to me, but that are great men that are in their 70s that I love and appreciate and learn from tremendously. Ed Paul, my friend Ed Paul lives in California. Like I, my wife and I get together with, with Ed. We love, he loves our family. I love his family. Like he doesn't even have kids, right? But it's like, I love this guy. Right. And uh, I can learn from my point is, you know, at all stages and ages, I realize that if you are idle, if you're still it is it is also important that that is directed, which is why meditation is healthy. Right. To sit and have a practice of, you know, breathing and contemplating and understanding images and letting, the, or, you know, thoughts and images and letting them go. And the practice of, uh, you know, uh, of detaching right from things and not being stressed out. Like that's the practice of that, like not being rushed and hurried at all times. And then at the same time, if people are just sitting around worrying, <laughs> watching the news, sitting around thinking of worst case scenarios, all the things that are going wrong, all the things they didn't do in their life, all the things they're missing out on now, that's torture, right? So I think that it's part of what we need to do is we actually need to learn how to think, which is why teaching somebody how to be a learner or how to always have a growth mindset in their life that, hey, you always have room to grow. I mean, I hope to God, like I am learning and growing and reading and all that until the very, very end. So not only is that something that grandparents or parents or anybody should be practicing, but it should be that what they're teaching. They should be modeling that. Because like as an example, in our community, we talk about meditating and we say, um, you know, it's good to meditate, but a lot of guys get into the light, into the world where they're like, I'm going to meditate before my kids wake up. And I'm like, I want to meditate when my kids wake up because I want them to see me do it. <laughs> good right? luck with a four-year-old and a two-year-old for me. <laughs> that's okay. Like, here's the thing. It's like, that's, that's perfect, dude. That's a perfect time to start doing it. You put on, you put on your eye thing and you just keep teaching your kids. Like when this is on, I'm in meditation. 
right? This is what I'm doing. So this is you, you, so it, one of my friends, Christian just said the other day, he goes, you don't, um, you don't house, you're not house doing, you're not house. What do you, what do you say? You're not kid proofing your house. You're house proofing your kids, kids right? Yeah. And it's like that, but the, we teach people how to treat us and we should do that all along the way. Like we should be in a place where that's the case. So one is, I, let me answer your question specifically. I think it is how to be a listener and a learner, how to be curious. Like if you were to pass along one quality to a young person, one, if a young kid could pass along a quality to an older person, it would be to remain curious. That's why kids have so much to teach us, right? They remind us of what it's like to be fascinated by things. And so if we can hold on to that fascination and that curiosity and that, that joy, you know, um, boy, that's good for everybody, right? That's why young people should hang out with old people and old people with young people. And it's a beautiful uh, progression and uh, a, tr a transfer of information. It's why tribes, for millions of years, do we grow up in these tribes where the elderly people are with the young people and that we just get a chance to all support each other in the ways that we can. Well, and to me, I'd, I'd add number two, if not number one, are on the same plane as curiosity, which is so valuable. You know, something that my grandparents and parents constantly hammered in my head was just positive thinking. And, and I still have a can uh, in my office that is an old tomato soup can that my grandfather wrapped uh, uh, in this eye. So it's got an eyeball on the outside of it. So it's an eye can. <laughs> right? and so I, I've got I've got dozens of these things and I've That's handed cool. them out over the years. They just mean so much to me. And I think they really set a good foundation of positive thinking for me. And I hope that I hope that everybody's taking that time to set that foundation for their kids because it can be a, a pretty negative world uh, that we live in. And I think, you know, watching the news and then unconsciously we start bringing up that negativity around the kids. It can have a really damaging effect. Yeah. And Casey, one thing I want to say about this is that I, I want to, this was something we brought up earlier and it's really important, which is the power of listening. You know what kids really need is they don't need, they don't always need our advice. They need to just, they do at times, but of course they need to be heard. And I remember watching an interview one time and it was the most, it was the most unlikely person to say this brilliant thing. It was Marilyn Manson being interviewed on like whatever you know, a talk show. Okay. He was just being interviewed and it was shortly after the Columbine shooting. And the, what the person was, the, the interviewer was ultimately saying, if you go back and talk to the kids at Columbine, right, before they did this, uh, what would you say to them? And then Marilyn Manson re responds, he goes, that's the problem. He goes, I wouldn't say anything to them. I would just listen to them. And I was like, oh my God, like that's, that's brilliant. That's it. Like we, we often think it's like, you're not listening to me. I'm telling you the answer, right? I'm giving you the wisdom. And it's like, what we really need to do is oftentimes just be really good listeners. And it's like a good coach, ask questions, zip it, right? Ask more questions. Tell me more, which is why what's on your mind, you know, like that's what's on your mind. What are you thinking about? What are you excited about? Now, sometimes I ask that to my nine-year-old and the answer is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing would you learn i can't remember what, what was your favorite part of yesterday i can't remember what did we do yesterday like i mean i get this isn't easy but uh but but the more that we can just be in a place to be open to listening and and also ask questions of what's interesting to them hey look at that bug what do you like about that bug what's interesting about that bug right do you like all bugs just that bug like you know just you kind of travel down the Maybe. road that, that whatever they're excited about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And you know, I want to I want to make sure we get to this topic of environment planning and making sure your environment's really set up to make moments and really create the kids that you want to yeah. create. G give them uh, the values you want them to have from curiosity positivity, having yeah. the ability to just be excited about life, to under, maybe it's understanding finances, the value of hard work and money. And in your book, you talk about the importance of setting up the right environment. How do you shape the right environment uh, to make the most out of the time you have with your grandkids? Let's say they come over to your house. You want to shape that environment to have the biggest impact on them and really accomplish uh, the goal of spending some quality time. Well, you know, that, and that, it's going to be different for everybody, of course, based on where you live and what your resources are. Um, I mean, it, it, my, 
I'm thinking about like my parents' house, right? So when my kids visit grandma and grandpa, or when I think about the environment that was created for me um, when I was a little kid at my grandparents' house, you know, I think a, a large part of that is like when you shape an environment, I think about the, the keys for me, uh, dinner time, you know, shared dinner, t- dinner time. So creating a space to commune, to come together in one, one spot. So if you create an environment that invites people to gather, uh, I think that's really powerful. I, I think creating an environment that feels safe and psychological safety where you have like not just a physical environment of like what color is the carpet or the walls or what toys are laying on the floor, but you think about an, an emotional safety that exists in an environment where people feel free to express themselves and voice their opinions and talk about what works or what doesn't work, which is why we do happy crappy because we need to be in a place where we can talk about what's not going well for us and not be judged for it or shamed for it. For it right um, there's lots of fascinating things about environment I've studied this deeply and I'm very passionate about it I believe that we need to design our environments because it shapes our lives you know and um, I was sharing with you earlier that one of the things I wrote about in my book which I was fascinated by was this Ellen Langer study and she wrote a book called counterclockwise and I became fascinated about this actually relating to our our recipients that are fighting for their life and like how might an environment change the way that we actually like our health does it change literally our physical well-being to be in a different environment. So I I studied this, and one of the things I found, which is really interesting, was Ellen Langer did this study where she took a group of men that were in their 70s, and she put them in a retreat center where they ultimately, like, turned back the clock. Now, I know you you know, you read this in the book, so I'm telling this to the rest of your audience, but it's like what they did is they put magazines from 20 years ago, all the artwork, everything, all the decorations, all the appliances, everything was from 20 years ago. The men were instructed to dress as if it was 20 years ago. They were instructed to have conversations as if it was 20 years ago. For two weeks, they would do this. Prior to the experiment, they would measure uh, cognitive abilities, eyesight, hearing, um, you know, uh, flexibility, all of that. And then at the end of two weeks, after doing this experiment, uh, the majority of the men in that experiment in, it, it demonstrated, showed improvements in all areas. Their eyesight improved. Their hearing improved. Their arthritis was dissipating. They were literally, their hands were getting longer. They were taller. They were faster. They were more, more mobile. They were, it was remarkable of what would happen when you shape your environment and you have these environmental cues. And there's lots of work out there that you can research and study about this, but I think what's important is that, uh, you know, um, I think it's important to intentionally design a place that brings about positive emotions, that brings about the things that you likely value and that we all value, right? I, I think that's really important. So like Shell Lake, Wisconsin, where I talked about earlier, that's a place that's set up to attract kids. That is a place that is set up to attract families. And my dad said that was his grandfather's original vision. I want to build a spot that people want to come visit because I want all my family around. I want all my kids around, my grandkids around. So I want to create a spot that they want to come and feel connected. And by the way, this isn't a fancy lake house. This isn't like the cutting edge jet skis and what this is like. This is this is uh, passed along and owned by multiple people. And, you know, it's, it's nothing fancy. There aren't marble countertops. There's, but it's just full of heart and soul. So I think when we shape environments, we need to be doing those things. And we need to pay attention to what do people care about? Because not everybody cares about a lake house. Not everybody needs to have a lake house to create an amazing environment for their kids. Right. But whatever it is, you know, my my parents in their place, whether it's the garden that my mom's created so the kids can come and learn about, you know, flowers. Um, my dad setting up a pool table upstairs in the in the room because he just he knew that I love pool and he wanted to honor that. And he wanted to create a place where we could play games, um, whatever it is, we get intentional about that. Right. And I think that's key. You have to read your kids. What are your kids like? My kids love to climb. So everything around my house, you know, every gift that my grandparents have or that my parents have given to their grandkids has been to to nurture their their passions or their, you know, that's that's what I think about environment. That's awesome. And I think that this part of environment is really important, but I also have to ask about something else because I know you're a really well-traveled family mm-hmm. and you now live down in Austin, Texas, but you tested out a lot of different environments. I think about oh, yeah. six weeks at a time before you, you know, landed on Austin and said, this is what we're going to do. This yeah. is what's going to be our home. And a lot of the families we're working with are transitioning into retirement. Yeah. We're in Indiana. We're in you know, Michigan. They're in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois. Yeah, it's cold up here and they want to get to yes, the South. 
they want to get someplace warm. And sometimes it just seems like it's kind of, well, Florida seems like a nice place or Arizona seems like a nice place. And so we're just going to go there. How did you make the decision on where you ended up? If somebody's going through this transition and they're trying to think about, well, I want to downsize and I want to get, you know, someplace a little warmer. I mean, what kind of questions should they be asking themselves to make sure they end up in an environment they're going to be really happy in ultimately? Yeah. First, you have to ask what you, what you value, right? So we, we, when we did this, we sat down and said, what is important to us? Then once we had our values written down, we would then rank them in order of importance. So for us, for example, like climate was important. We just wanted to be in a place where we could be outside, mostly around, uh, you know, being active. That was really important to us. Uh, by the way, I have a friend who lives in Hudson, Ohio, and he's like, you, you know, I don't want to move to Austin because I love the cold. I love the seasons. I love the ski resort being right near our house. Like to, that, that's for him is really important. So, you know, I get to each their own, right? It's important to know what's important to you. My wife grew up in Krasnoyarsk, Siberia until she was 18 years old, where it gets to be negative 40. She had all the cold she ever needed for the rest of her life and wanted to find somewhere that was warmer year round. So we, what we did is we wrote out those values. We looked at all the places that could possibly fit those values, climate, culture, community, the things that we felt, even the size of the city or how big does the airport need to be? How many direct flights we need? Because there's benefits to small airports. There's benefits to big airports, right? Like how important was that? How much travel did we want to do? What was the cost of living? What type of house could we get? Did we really want? Those are all things we had to consider. Big, big equation, clearly. But then we found, we narrowed it down, Southern California, Denver, uh, tech, you know, Austin, Texas was on the list, Richmond, Virginia, where my family was, not so much the warm part, but warmer than Philly, which is where we were, uh, Boca, Florida, you know, in the Jupiter area, we looked down there, and we would go to these places, we'd rent a house or stay with friends or rent a car, go out to eat at the restaurants, go see the schools, go integrate into the community. We looked at Athens, Georgia, we lived there for six weeks, like rented a house, and like it was great. Finally, we landed in Austin and we just had to trust a little bit of, we had to trust the gut. When you get to it where you're ranking, this one's got this, this one's got that. Sometimes you just need to say, what's my gut say? And the gut said at this one, like Austin's the spot. And so trust our gut made the move six months later, we were living in Austin. And, and so far it's been two years. It's been the best decision we've made perhaps ever. Yeah. Like it is, well, it's a big decision. It's one of the best. And, but we also knew it wasn't irreversible. We're like, it's not a permanent decision. Like it's a pain in the butt to pack up your house and move it. But if we get there and we're not happy, we could just move somewhere else. Yeah. You know, well, it's, it's, I'm glad we were bold. Like, I, you know, and I really credit my wife. She was really the one. I was like, oh, it's the business. We're launching a book. Do we really want to do this? And she's like, yes. And we want to do it now. Like, That's yeah. awesome. Well, I hope that people take that to heart, really make uh, that decision an important one and spend just as much time on that decision as they're spending on the retirement plan. And I know you've got to get going here, yeah. um, but I, I'd love to wrap it up with one last question. I'm probably going to kind of wrap a comment and a question all into one because there was something you said in your book that I think really applies to this last question. You said that you wrote a line on a sheet of paper representing your lifetime, put a dot on where you currently were. I was kind of wondering you know, what, why you did that, what the impact was I think it'd be valuable for people to hear that but you know it's not going to be what you're thinking well I'm just wondering how that applies to retirement and what you what you think uh what retirement really means to you yeah well I think it's important that we all know that we all suffer from a life-threatening illness called being human and the, and the the thing that's true for you Casey and me and everybody listening regardless of what <clears throat> stage we're at along the journey is that this ride's going to end for all of us right like that's not uh, a thought that should uh, make us sad long term. That might that might feel a little sad for the moment to think the ride's going to end. I get that it should, but that should also shake us a little bit to remind us that these aren't days that we ever get back. Like when I do this podcast, I, re I remind myself that you only get a certain number of minutes in your life. That's it. You get a certain number of minutes. We're talking today. I'm not with my wife. I'm not with my kids. You're not with your wife and kids. You're not building. You're not doing, you're not talking with some other client. You're not taking care of your health. You're not running. You're not, you're with me. This is part of our, right? Like it's important to know how valuable our minutes are and to recognize that to me, here's where this whole thing started. It started because I, I became, I developed a fear of flying in my thirties, partially because when I'm younger, I'm just like, I'm invincible. Other people die, but not me right? That nothing's ever going to happen to me until one day it hits me that I'm like, I'm just in a plane with engines and like things break. Other planes have fallen out of the sky. This one could, and that could be it for me done. 
right? That thought terrified me. It was like almost I had a reality. The reality hit me that I was not invincible. When that hit me, that's when I pulled out my journal. That's when I said, let me look at my life. Let me, this is my birth over here. This is my death. Let's imagine that I live to be 100. I don't know. How many of those are amazing years that I could do anything I want? I, I don't know, 80, 90? I, I don't really know. I'm just guessing. And where am I? At the time, I was like late, my late 30s. I put a dot on the paper and I could see the half yard line. I mean, the 50, 50 yard line, right? And I thought, oh my gosh, like the visual of that's very powerful. And I think the visual of that, the, the understanding that our days are numbered in some ways is not meant to paralyze. It's meant to excite us and, and remind us, don't waste your time right? Like get after it, right? Have fun. Don't just be bold. My mom's 75, just had knee surgery. Cause she's like, I got things to do. Like I got, I want to run and exercise and garden. And like, I can't let this knee thing get in my way. Right. So I think that's a, it's a really important piece of it. And I, I might've written this in the book too. I can't remember, but about this guy who had a, a bowl full of marbles and he counted out, like if I live to be a hundred, how many um, Saturdays do I have? And he would count them out. And he, every Saturday, he'd move a marble from one bowl to another. Mm. So he'd be reminded that this is going to end and not to take these days for granted. I think whatever works for you, and everybody's different, but for me, that gets me moving. That gets me excited. That gets me out of bed. That, that keeps me engaged because I'm like, there are no minutes to waste. There are no moments to waste. No time with my kid, it can be wasted. No time with my mom and dad can be wasted. At any moment, anything could be taken, right? It, every, at any moment, things can happen, like it can, a car accident or whatever. It's like one moment you're fine, next moment you're battling something serious. My only thought is for people to consider how valuable your days are and to give the gift to yourself and to those around you to make the most of them. So exciting, John. I love, uh, love talking to you. I love reading your stuff. Uh, you just that's motivated motivation enough. I don't know if I'm going to do the whole marble thing. That, that just seems kind of depressing on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, you but, do, it, do it's work. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, simply just doing that exercise, I've done it with clients, you know, where you might take out a tape measure actually and say, Hey, how long do you think you're going to live? Yeah. Put your finger on 85. Now, how old are you today? Okay. This is how much time you got left. You know, how are you going to use it? How are you going to make the most of it? Uh, we need to live with purpose and we need to help all of those around us, especially our grandkids, if you're lucky enough to have them. So thanks John for this time. I know we got to run, uh, but I really appreciate our conversation. Can't wait to see you in a few weeks. Yeah, man. Thanks, Casey. All right. Thanks, John.